And now let's pick up where we left off last week. I asked Ben and Kimberly about the rise of anti-conversion laws in South Asia. In a number of places, it is now illegal to encourage someone to follow Jesus Christ if that means they're converting out of the religion they grew up in. Whether that be Hinduism or Buddhism or Islam, it is illegal to encourage them to change their religion. And I asked if these laws put Ben and Kimberly and other gospel workers in South Asia at risk. It it doesn't scare me. I've been to prison before. (laughs) (laughs) You're not intimidated. (laughs) Not that I want to go back, but... (laughs) Yeah, that that seems like a flippant answer, but that's, that's the truth. We believe that God has called us to this place in this time. And we believe that we have a message to share, and if there are consequences to that, we'll accept them. We're careful in how we do what we do, Mm -hmm. primarily not for our own safety, but primarily so that what we are doing doesn't hurt the national Mm -hmm. church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, We are very careful to make sure that we are are doing things so that the church itself is protected. Um, So, for example, we have a, a... national team that we work with. We're the only foreigners in our region, so we work with a national team. Our team will go into villages and we'll do open-air evangelism. We don't go with them and do that. We let the nationals take the lead with those sorts of things. So we obviously can't hide what we're doing in the region that we live and work in. And so people know who we are. They know what we're doing. We have a good relationship with the government officials at this point, and so things are okay. But we do, we have seen things change in the last few years. The government will go through every so often and will arrest pastors and just keep them in jail for a couple of days, mostly just to kind of flex their muscles and say, kind of make a point. Mm-hmm, yeah. See, just know that we can do this. And, and we don't intentionally go down in front of the government office mm-hmm. and do religious work either. So mm-hmm. we don't hide who we are, what we do. We're careful about it. Mm-hmm. But we, but we you don't the, uh, shame them either no. by mm-hmm. by sort of sticking it in their face. Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And we kind of both believe that that when we leave the region we work in, that it won't necessarily be our choice. We kind of think that day's coming. Mm-hmm. Interesting. There's a great deal of urgency in the work as a mm-hmm. result of that because we want these churches to be able to stand on their own. We want the work to continue because the people are trained and equipped and have been discipled to a point that they have a depth in their faith that they can continue the work. So that if we do have to leave, it's not dependent on Mm -hmm. the Westerners or anything. Mm -hmm. It can carry on and it's strong and there's a solid church. The church itself is not scared of coming persecution. Ben will ask pastors every once in a while, well, what if they start putting pastors in jail? What are you? We just preach. We preach the gospel. It doesn't matter. We just started church in jail. We'll just preach in jail. Wow. And part of that, I think, actually is because the DNA of the church in the country that we work in has persecution within it. There, there are they've still, always seen they've persecution. always seen persecution. They've always thought that mm-hmm. was part of following Jesus. Yes. And so it's not a big shock to them. It's, it's just not. like, yeah, okay, it's my mm-hmm. turn. And for us personally and for the church there, we always talk about that if persecution does come to us, it's like the scripture says, for us to be counted worthy mm. to suffer for Christ, what greater privilege and honor is there? Mm. And if that day comes, then we'll just praise the Lord and thank the Lord for it. Not mm. that we want it. Right. Mm. We're not seeking it. Mm. But, but we're going to always glorify him through it. It is a different mindset, though, to see that as an honor and a blessing instead of as a something to be completely avoided and to be run away from. Mm-hmm. <laughs> to be afraid of yeah. or to fear. Yeah. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Ben and Kimberly. They are gospel workers in South Asia. Uh, Ben and Kimberly, I want to talk about a village where you have really seen God do amazing things. And I don't think we want to mention the name of the village to protect uh, the work that's going on there. But can you just kind of share the story of how God opened the door in this completely closed place, and now today we have brothers and sisters who are meeting there and worshiping God every week? It is. This village is an incredible 
incredible testimony to the Lord building his church. And uh, the story of this village is we first went there in 2016, did a little bit of research in the village. It was a village that was very, very dark, very uh, closed to Christianity. Really idle, didn't, idle on every rooftop. Idle on every village. roof. There is, they say as many as 70% of the people in that village are witch doctors, one form of power or another. So it was very, very resistant. Outsiders to Westerners really didn't want any any outside influence. Then in 2016, there was a fire in the village and several homes were destroyed. And they called uh, our partner, who is a pastor there in, in the country, and said, could you come help us? We've heard that Christians will help us. And so he called me and said, can we go help this village? Which is fascinating. Like, we don't want Christianity in our village. We don't, but we've heard Christians will help us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, who did they hear that from? That, that's <laughs> such a weird thing. Yeah, it is. It is. So we said, absolutely, we'll go, we'll go. And so we went there, and the fire had destroyed several homes. Several families had lost everything. It's a very, very, very poor village. They have very little to start with. And so we went and we helped them with blankets and rice and some of the necessities of life. And when we were there, we asked if we could pray if we could pray for them, and they they said yes that that would be okay. So my national partner and I, a pastor, we knelt down that day and we said, Lord, build your church here here in this village. They 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 desperately need to know the hope that's found in Jesus Christ to know the truth of you. To, they need to know you as their Lord and their God. Just build your church here. So we left that day and didn't hear anything more from them for... Mm-hmm. The uh, next time we had an opportunity to be in that village was 2019. So three years later. Mm-hmm. Three years later. Mm-hmm. We had wow. tried. We had tried to, because we really felt a burden for this community because it, it just felt, we live and work in a very dark region, but this village felt darker than like anywhere else. Like the darkest else. part yes. of the dark place. Yes. <laughs> And we had a real burden for this community. And so we tried. We had tried to see if there were water projects that we could do or other humanitarian things that we could do, which is those are the vehicles we use to get into villages that have no presence of Christianity. And the village elders just didn't want us in there. And it wasn't just us. They didn't want our national team in there either. They didn't want outsiders in their community. Especially Christians. Especially Christians. So in 2019... We had two midwives from the United States who came over and we did a series of women's health education programs in villages. And that was the first time that the village elders said, yeah, it's okay. You can come and you can do that here. We'll take that. And we had a couple hundred women come to a, like a six hour education. So one day. Yeah, it was we'll a We'll let you thing. come for mm-hmm. one day and, and we thought go on home. We thought maybe it was a door opening at the time, but that was, it was fall of 2019 and we don't do much in the winter in our region because we it's hard, very difficult to travel between villages in the winter. And once spring came, so did COVID. <laughs> so and then the our whole world yeah, shut down. so our country completely shut down and we couldn't travel between villages and so just there was nothing that could happen. And then in March of 2021, Ben was preaching at our primary church. And two guys that we didn't know came in the back door of the of the church and sat down. And we're always a little hesitant about that. And after service, Ben and our national partner went and started talking to the guys to find out who they were. And we asked them where they were from. They said they were from this particular village. And we were shocked. We said, no, it can't, can't be from this village? And they said, yeah. And we, and they were friendly. And they were friendly. <laughs> and we said, well, what are you doing here? And <laughs> they said, well, we want to know more about this God you're talking about. We want to know more about who you worship. And, and, we, and we were just shocked, quite After frankly. After you picked your jaws up off yeah. the floor, yeah. we're like, sure, we'd love to have that conversation. <laughs> so we said, we said, great. So we sit down with them, and we begin to share the gospel with them. And in this context, you start at the very beginning. We could say, this is the Bible. This is the Word of God. There's one God. There's not these multiple gods as they believe. There's one God. He's a creator. We rebelled against him as man. We are accountable to him. We sinned against him. It's, it's, so you just have to kind of walk through the whole scriptures, and it takes three to four hours to do this. And at the end, he said, yeah, he said, I'm ready to believe. He said, I don't believe right now. And I told <laughs> him, 
I told him, I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you're from this village. I said, you know what's going to happen to you if you come to Christ. I said, you'll be disowned. You'll lose everything you own. Your family will kick you out. You'll have nothing. You'll be homeless. You're losing everything if you come to Christ. So you have to be sure about this. I said, I need you to go home and think about it. And he said, no, I'm ready to believe right now. And I said, no, just, <laughs> just wait. You really have to be sure. I said, come back next week. If you're serious, come back next week. The other guy said, yeah. He said, I'm not so sure. I, I, need, I need to go back and think about this a little bit more. The one guy, he said, nope, I want to believe right I'm now. I'm not going home for a week. He oh, said, I'm not going home. I'm, I'm believing this. right now. So we said, okay. So we, we knelt down that day and, and led him to Christ that day. Mm -hmm. And he, so he was the first believer. And mm -hmm. after that, he told us, he said, there's 12 or 15 more people that are ready to hear this truth in my village. And so our, my partner and I, and we were kind of like, no, there isn't. <laughs> we've tried to crack yeah, we've, that egg. We've been, crack. To your, we've been to your place. <laughs> we know what it's like. And he said, no, really, there is. There's more people waiting to hear. And we said, wow. So, okay. Our partner started going over once a week and doing house fellowship, which we, at that point, we had gone back into a second lockdown. And so it was actually kind of against the rules that he was traveling between villages. Uh -huh. But he would still go over once a week. And he would do house fellowship. This particular village is about a two and a half hour walk from where our campus is, our Bible school walk. is. Walk. Not drive. No, walk. <laughs> walk. <laughs> and every week more people were coming to house fellowship and more people were coming to Christ. And by the fall, by September, there were 14 believers and more people were interested. And what was amazing was so many people came to Christ so quickly that the village really never had time to organize against them. And so the the persecution that we expected to happen in this village never happened. Because there were so many. Mm -hmm. Not not like we expected it to. Mm -hmm. And even that first time that we met, that the church met in this village. So I was preaching that day and we had the believers were there, mm -hmm. a few new people, and then in walked about, I can't remember, 14 oh, yeah, or 15 yeah. old men came in and sat down. And we asked people, who's that? And they said, oh, those are the village elders. Those are all the Hindu priests that are here. Oh, my. And so Kimberly looked they at wanna, They want to know what you're doing. Yeah. They were here. And so Kimberly actually looked at me and she said, well, Ben, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to preach the word. And so preached that first message that day. And they, after service, they said, we want to know more. Tell us more. Wow. Because they had come to check out what was going on, what was this new group, what were people believing in. And so we shared the gospel with them that day, and several of them came to Christ, that first of mm -hmm. the village elders. And then from then on, it just, mm -hmm. the gospel began to spread, and this one man just couldn't, he couldn't stop sharing about this faith, this good news that he now had, mm -hmm. and he wanted everybody to know. When we all walked up into the village for the first day that we were going to have church, we walked up along the path, and Ben said, you're not going to believe this. I said, what? And it turned out that the place the church is meeting in the very first believer's home is the same location that Ben and our national partner knelt down and prayed on in 2016 that God would build a church. That man who was the first man to come to Christ in that village was the man whose home had burned down in 2016. So me and my national partner the very place where we had knelt down in the ashes of that fire that day and prayed that the Lord would build his church in this village. We were, we were just thinking, hey, Lord, just build you anywhere here. It'd be great. And it wasn't the building. It was just the people build your church. But that day, the very place that we had knelt down was where this man's home now stood. And it was top wow. of his home where we met. That And that's where the church is now. It was, it was the Lord saying, look, look at the way look I'm going to answer your prayer. Look, look what I did. Look what I did. Exactly. I am a Muslim, or let me correct myself. I was a Muslim. So right now I'm at a point where uh, I'm, I'm yet to decide whether I have to remain as a Muslim or should become a Christian. Could you please help me with a couple of contradictions, what we can see in Quran? Yeah, the Quran is full of contradictions. So he's asking me to show him contradictions. Okay, I have a lot of articles on this, but we'll discuss some. Watch how unclear the Quran is, because the Quran says it explains everything in details, and I'll give you the ayat in a minute. Now, if I just read the Quran and I said to you, glory be to him who carried his servant, Who's the servant? If I okay. ask you from the Quran, show me who the servant is. You can't show me, right? Right, right. Now, the Hadiths tell you it's Muhammad, but with the Quran, you don't know it's Muhammad. But who okay. is speaking? Who's saying glory be to him? 
definitely can't be Allah because you can't say glory be to him. Oh, so it but you have to say it's Allah because the Muslims say this is the kalam Allah, Allah speaking. But you no, caught the problem. Yeah. So you caught it, guys. How can Allah say to himself, glory be to him? There's no logic. It's absolute nonsense. Uh, that... No logic. It's nonsense, huh? The speaker then says, glory be to him who carried his servant by night from the holy mosque to the further mosque, the precincts of which we have blessed that we might show him some of our ayat. So who's the we? one? Saying? We. And we show them our ayat, our miracles, our signs. How it's we. Like, I didn't get it. That's your Quran. It's supposedly Allah speaking in the plural, we. Now I'm going to yeah. show you a bigger problem on the screen. Watch here. Oh my goodness. Yep, exactly. Look at the confusion here. You thought that's bad? Watch here. Glory be to him who carried his sermon by night from... Masjid al-Haram to Masjid al-Aqsa, the precincts of which we have blessed that we might show him some of our signs. So who is the him that they're going to show miracles to? I wonder if it's talking about the Holy Trinity is what I guess. Okay, well, the Quran, some believe it was originally a Christian text that was corrupted. But if we go with the Muslim argument... In fact, you know, if you just watch this video again, I, I'm really wondering about that. It's the first time in my life that I ever addressed the Trinity as holy. And trust me, it was not something which came out of me with my own conscience. So you are just confessing. First time in your life, you uttered involuntarily, you didn't choose to, the words holy trinity. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah. a true God who is Trinity, who is holy, is calling you and he's showing you the truth. So just be patient. He will bring you to the truth. And if you're honest with yourself, be honest with yourself. L examine the life of Muhammad and compare it to Jesus. You're going to see there's no way Jesus is a mere man and Muhammad can be a prophet. Uh, can I give you one example that bothers me to this day? Yeah, please. please. Okay. In the Quran, chapter 4, verse 24, also forbidden forbidden for you to have sex with are women already married except those captives and slaves whom your right hands possess if a jihadi or the muslims attack your area and they take over the quran says you can capture the women married women and have sex with them and sell them let me give you the hadith for you here hear it out the quranic verse and all married women are forbidden unto you Save those captives whom your right hands possess. This is to say that they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period to make sure they're not pregnant. And what's the grading here? Watch the grading. Sahih. Sahih. Man, I quit, man. You just, say what? That's enough. I quit, I quit. Just That's enough. You quit, Islam? Yep, 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 yep. yep Glory yep, yep, to yep. the Father. Son and Holy Spirit. But you quit Islam. You're sure. Oh. Oh. You quit Islam. Yep. 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 It's time. It's so time. You renounce Muhammad. Absolutely. Absolutely. You believe Muhammad is an antichrist false prophet? Yeah. It's pretty clear. Yeah. Okay. Now, you said you wanted evidence to decide to become Christian. So now you just confess Muhammad is an antichrist false prophet. What's stopping you from now crying out to Jesus? To be frank, as I just said, when the second when I use the word holy, something is hitting me. Because still, I wonder why did I use that word? Because I shouldn't as a Muslim. I shouldn't use it. But that, that single word is actually haunting me. It's like literally haunting me. Why and how did I use that word? The Holy uh, Spirit is working in your heart. Let me show you what Jesus says to you. Ready? Now, let me give you the words of Jesus. Matthew eleven twenty-seven 27 to 30. Jesus speaking. All things have been delivered to me by my Father. So God is his Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son. And the one to whom the Son will reveal. And what Jesus is saying is, the true God is someone that you can only know by coming to Jesus. Jesus saying, I am the son of the father. The father knows me and I know him. And I'm the only one who can make him known. So if you want to know God, Jesus says, you must come to me. Because now look at his invitation. Come to me. 
all you who labor and are heavy laden, all you who are tired and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is, is light. So Jesus is saying, you want to know God? You have to come to me. I'm the only one that can make God known to you. I'm the Father, Son, His Son, sent to find you, bring you home, bring you to God, make you His Son, and give you rest. But you have to come to me. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, Sam, over here. Actually, I am showing this. Like my entire family is watching this, and yeah. um, it's not that I just want to save myself all alone. So I was really confused with this stuff. I disclosed this in my family as well that I think something is wrong here. And I, I'm even thinking of Christianity wherein they were really offended by both those statements. So that's the reason I called you. And my entire family is watching this right in Good. right now, right beside me. Good. So they 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 are literally crying. I know They're that. Crying? I can see that. Yeah, yeah. They are they are crying. The moment when I said I'm quit, I quit, and I can see indications in them that even they are gonna take the same decision. This is the what Lord. I guess. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Glory oh. to you, Lord Jesus. Glory My. to you, Son Almighty. So now the choice is yours, brother. You have to decide. No pressure. You can yeah. confess publicly now. Jesus is your Lord and you believe in him. He and then you begin. gradually explain this to my parents, wherein they were obviously offended, but uh, they understood me. In fact, right now, we admit and agree that we are going to be Christians, sir. You agreed you're going to all be Christian? Yeah, seven of us. All seven of us. Seven. Seven family members are going to give their life to Jesus.